No one, I don't care what anybody tells you about your child, no one, they should label jars, not people. No one rises to low expectation. And when you have low expectation for people, you treat them in a certain way. Did you hear what I just said? You treat them a certain way. How you look at them, how you talk to them, what your expectations are for them and the tools that you make available for them and the time, the energy and the effort that you put in with them. People learn differently. I'm among those. I can't write a speech, but guess what? I can give you a speech. Writing it just straight out, that's not my style. I have to talk into a, a computer or a recorder and have it transcribed. That's my style. Everybody have their own style of how they approach this thing called life. And with the help of a Mike Williams, I went from just speaking and clowning in a class and, 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 and speaking at churches and, and, and elementary schools and high school to speaking at major corporations around the world. What happened? Same speaker, same person, but I met someone that showed me Here's how you can have a breakthrough in your ability with that gift of gab that you use when you're playing a card game called Bid Whist. Oh, uh, you've never been to Boston, I'll take you there. That, that same personality that you use when you're playing cards and, and when you're playing chess. Oh, the, the, the game at first, it was called Hess, but my middle name is Calvin. And so they put C in front of S A, I mean H E S S after me. See, that same personality, he took this person that you see now that was labeled educable, did, mentally retarded, and took this voice and this story and a different approach that allowed me to be able to change people's lives. When Miles Monroe, Dr. Miles Monroe, I talk about him a lot, I miss him. He said, Rob the cemetery rob the cemetery of your genius just look at your life right now i'm asking you to look at your life just begin to review yourself this distance that you've come thus far that distance is longer than the distance that you have left and i encourage you if you're ready to maximize that i encourage you if you're ready to live from your greatness i'm i'm encouraging you if you're ready to take a chance on you but what if i don't make it so what nat turner he never lived to see us being free but he struck a blow that ultimately broke the back of slavery and millions of other brothers and sisters live with a sense of urgency be willing to change your approach Get some help. Most people won't ask for help. Why? Because of pride. Pride cometh before fall. Because of ego. Ego. Edging God out. It's a time you got to live this same life like you mean business. Like you mean business. If you if you believe this is a different time, you know time is, is so different. It seems like the days are, are faster now. I don't know if it's because of my age, but it just seemed like they're gone. That's gone. Here's what I know. The older you get, it seems like you don't get 30 days out of the month. You, you get about 15 or 20. And if you owe a lot of money at the end of the month, you, you, you might get two weeks out of the month. But that's the way it's it. Didn't I just pay that bill yesterday? Don't tell me. I know I just paid that bill yesterday. I know, Daddy, no. <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you, it seems like when you owe a lot of money, it's just, it just the time go by so fast. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Just It seems like, oh, my goodness. The days are just just flying by. And when I wake up in the morning, I, I look at myself and I always say, I thank God for being able to wake up this morning in my right mind. <laughs> All things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Lord, whatever I face today, together you and I can handle it. What day is it you said? <laughs> I, I believe that life is for living, for loving, 
and being healthy and and live, living a meaningful life, a purposeful life. Why, why purposeful? Well, because it narrows your choices. I, I spent time talking to my son last night. I said, you know, I said, I don't have a void in my life because I don't know who my father was that I'm aware of. I'm adopted, okay? But what I was saying to him, I said, the conversation but that I'm going to have with you right now is a conversation if I knew my father that he would have with me. And right now, I'm feeling that. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you and share some things with you that I've seen, that I've experienced. And ultimately, it's your call. It's your choice. But I've seen a thing or two. I know a thing or two. I can't make the choices for you. All I can share with you to minimize the, 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 the pain and, and disappointment and just living a life that's not you, that does not represent the highest that's within you. I'm, I'm gonna talk to you now about some things that that I'm encouraging you to do so that your future you, your future life that's in you will say, man, I'm glad you did that. Wow, I'm glad you made that choice. I said, are you with me? He said, yes, sir, dad. I said, don't, don't you have anything to say? Well, he said, well, I'm not going to argue for my limitations. All right, because I was telling him about something. I said, you don't want to do that. That's, a, that's, that's not going to help you. Make choices and ask yourself the question, is this going to bring the best out of me? Is, is this moving my life and the direction that represent the highest that is within me? Or is this going to take me down a path at some point in time, I will regret that I made this choice. Robert Frost, come forth, please. Two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and I, I selected the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. The road to life is straight and narrow, and few there be that find it, because few there be that are willing to be disciplined. Few there be that are willing to listen. Few there be that are coachable. Few there be that are willing to leverage the experiences of other people so they can maximize their impact in this thing called life. You can't tell them anything. There's nothing worse than arrogance and ignorance. People who think they know and they don't know. If, you, if you're not one of those people and, and, and you're ready to be coached or you're ready for breakthrough thinking as Dr. Stan would say, Dr. Breakthrough, yeah, yeah. Hello, I got it like that. As as Reverend Ike would say, you can't lose with the stuff I use. <laughs> oh, behave. <laughs> Why are you laughing? You got to laugh today. You got to. You, you got to find ways and create special moments. I'm I'm creating a moment that we spend together. You're going to be saying to some of your friends. You know what? I watched that crazy boy, Les Brown, Mamie Brown's baby boy. He had me rolling, child. He needs he, he need some help. He's a little touch his head, really. He, he cut his flat top off, too. Yeah, he used to be looking like kid in play from house party. Yeah, he used to cut the flat top off. Somebody got to him. <laughs> no, they did not. Did not, not, not. I just did it because it's a new year. I'm going to get it done in 21. There's some things I'm determined to do, determined to accomplish. What is it that you're determined to do? That you are determined to accomplish, that you've been going at it again and again and again, and, and, and you fail, and now you're ready to quit, or you've already quit. I'm saying to you, come, Lazarus, come forth. Had to call him three times. Come on, you, you got the power to come out of there. Lazarus, didn't you hear me? You know something. People watch and say, you know, I think Jerusalem Slim has lost it. He called and we told him the man's dead. Yeah, there are a lot of people walking around with a lot of potential in them that's dead. 
greatness in them that's dead. Genius in them that's dead. Abilities and talents that need to be resurrected that's dead. Greatness and, and abilities to change the world that need to be called for three times. Lazarus, come for. Whoa, wow. He said, brothers and sisters, start running from everywhere. Oh, my Lord, good Lord. That's a good Google Google. <laughs> They say, he's on fire. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Wow. The distance that I have traveled so far is longer than the distance I have left. Is that the same for you? We don't know how much time we have left. If that the same for you, have you had some setbacks and failures and and you have convinced yourself it can't be done? No. Change your approach. But don't change your decision. Get some help. Because by changing your approach and getting some help, you can take your performance and your impact to another level by getting the right help and the right coaching. You can live a life that will outlive you. Oh, you have greatness in you. Yes, yes, absolutely you do. That, it's not judged by how much money you have or your materialistic possessions. It's not judged by that. No. No. I've never seen an ambulance or hearse at a funeral carrying some money behind it or furniture or home dragging all that stuff out to the cemetery no they don't bury you with homes with your brand new car your Rolex watch no no you wouldn't leave it all there when Howard Hughes who was the richest man in the world died Somebody asked on the plane, how much did he leave? And the answer was, all of it. <laughs> Guess what? By clock, my friend who passed, she said, life don't owe me any change. I've lived life my way. Live your life in such a way that life don't owe you any change. Or you got a goal, a dream. Just say, you know, I got this, this, this dream that that keeps showing up, and and it's up in my face. Something that I want to do with my life. Okay, all right, I got you. I know that. I had this goal and dream of buying my mother home, and I did it. I did it. I'm working with somebody right now who they have the same dream. I said, good. I'm going to show you how to do that. It came to me. And they, we have a form that people fill out where we vet and find out what is it you want to do? What's your goal? What's your dream? If you are hungry to win, if you're hungry to overcome your fears, if you're hungry to learn how to use your voice, if you're hungry to live a larger life, if you're hungry to live a life of adventure, Helen Keller said that life is either a daring adventure or it's boring. If you're hungry to transition out of a job that's not you and want to learn how to do something that is you, if you are in that kind of place and you know that you just feel it in your heart of hearts, the best is yet to come. The best in me is yet to come. What I've gone through will not define me. The best is yet to come. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. The best is yet to come. You are more than a conqueror. The best is yet to come. Be with that. Know that. And live your life from that place of power. How did you, how did you overcome the cancer? Like, how, and I know this wasn't your first battle. This was your second, correct? Mm -hmm. How did you overcome that? 
who did you have to be? Because I heard you quote a stat and I hope that you quote it today um, about our immune system. And um, how did you say no? I'm going, I'm debt free, I'm cancer free, and I'm drama free. Like, yeah. how did well, you do that? The oncologist, it, it was a bad brother, who graduated from Howard University. Howard, uh, his name was Mr. Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so he said, Mr. Brown, I got some bad news. What is it? You have cancer. Oh. I said, Well, I said, is there anything else? He said, Yes. It's metastasized to seven theories of your body. Oh. I said, Wow. He said, why are you smiling? I said, man, seven is my lucky number. Wow. I'm one of seven children. I was born February the 17th. Joshua marched around the walls of Jericho seven times. Mm. Naaman dipped himself in the river Jordan seven times. I said, is there anything else? He said, yes. I said, what? He said, and you're ugly too. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> he said, but you got this. He said, I never tell my patients they're terminally ill. What I say is that my skills, my abilities have terminated. Mm. I determine the diagnosis. You and God determine the prognosis. Mm. And a verdict. As we look at ourselves, the verdicts of what take place in our lives are not determined by the facts. Mm. It's determined by us, our faith, our heart and our willingness to do what's required in order for us to be here. Being here is not a gift. Oh, so good. I, I heard you, you said something along the lines of our immune system drops. What was yeah, that percentage? When someone looks at you and say that you have a terminal illness, your capacity of your immune system to protect you drops by 40%. Wow. In the UK, they don't even allow doctors to say that you are terminally ill wow. anymore. Because of the area of psychoneuroimmunology, words have power. That's why in yes. the Bible it says, death and life is in the tongue. Yeah, the tongue and yeah. we speak too much death, as opposed to speaking life. Yeah. And a diagnosis is not a verdict. Yes. Yes, and so there are some people, they leave as a result of hearing those words. And, and what he said, I determine the diagnosis, you and God determine the prognosis. Yes. And that works for me. Yes. Yeah, I have a friend who I talked to yesterday. She was told because she had breast cancer that she was terminally ill. And she said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you have six months. And she said, listen to me. She said, you determine the diagnosis. Mm. God determines the timetable. Mm. Stay in your lane. Ooh. And that was eight years ago. Come oh, on, wow. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. She says, stay in your lane. Oh, I have goosebumps. I Because people so often, you know, the book Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Yes. And he talks about drifters, right? Yes. Because so many people are drifting inside of their lives and they're never really certain about most things. They allow the people, the places, the things, the opinions, the judgments, the diagnosis to tell them who and how they're going to be. And then they choose to believe it. But wow, you, you just, oh, how powerful it is to just know this is, you can say whatever you want, but this is what I'm believing. And sometimes we win that battle and sometimes yes, we don't. and we have to work consciously. Reading, having a ritual like you have and yes. I have. Yes. Reading something positive every day. Yes. 30 or 40 pages. Listening to messages that are designed to empower us. Dr. Carter G. Woodson said, if you can determine what a man should think, yes. you never have to concern yourself with what he would do. Oh. He said, if you can make a man feel inferior, you never have to compel him to seek an inferior status, Oof. or he will seek it himself. And if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, you never have to order him to go to the back door. He'll go without being told. And if there's no door, his very nature will demand I spoke in a prison in Ohio, and these young guys came in and sat in the pants. I said, hey, what y'all call that? I'm an old man. They said, Sagan. I said, wow. I said, how you, how you spell it? He said, uh, what, Sagan? Yeah, S-A-G-G-I-N. I said, wow. If you can determine what a man should think, you never have to concern yourself with what he would do. I said, spell it again. And he said, S-A-G-G-I-N. I said, now spell it backwards. 
Oh. We got quiet. I said, I'm here to eliminate the virus, HIV, for the infected virus. Oh. AIDS, addiction to incarceration, and death syndrome. Don't come for me. I didn't call him. Oh, I'm ready to cry right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, sheesh. That just hit my soul. And it's, it's the, it's the, it's, it's the, we subscribe, like whose story are you subscribing to? Come on now. And then when you teach people, oh, okay, you don't have to choose this story. That's right. If I want to learn about Les Brown, I'm not going to go learn about how to knit kitten hats, you know, like yes. it's just not what you do. You have right. to be in line, in alignment with what you, what it is that you want. I have to ask you. Do you feel like you are mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, physically, energetically as strong as you are now because of your upbringing? I know that they say there's nothing like having a praying woman in your life. Come on. Now. And I know that Miss Mamie Brown, you yes. know, I, I know. You know, I always say all that I am, all that I hope to be, mm. I owe to my mother, yes. Miss Mamie Brown. And God took me out of my biological womb. Mm -hmm. and, and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. Mm -hmm. I'm adopted. Mm -hmm. My birth parents are discovered uh, last year. They're like the, the, the 45 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. I was conceived in Gainesville, Georgia, but my birth mother came down to Miami to give birth to us and put us up for foster care and adoption. And, and what I now am saying, I used to end my speeches by saying, this has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. My birth mother's name is Dorothy Bell Rucker. She was a motivation speaker. And they have a museum for my grandmother. Her name is Beulah Rucker. So now I said, this has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy and Dorothy Bell Rucker's pride and joy. Oh. I've got two mothers and I'm not ashamed. I've got two mothers and I love them just the same. Uh, if you close your eyes, I sound just like John Legend. <laughs> you sound smooth for sure. <laughs> wow, wow. What do you think was the biggest lesson? I have one moment that happened in my life with my mom. She wasn't even teaching. It was just experiencing my mom being the most resilient that I had ever seen her. My dad ruptured a disc in his back when I was about 10 years old. Uh, my mom was trying to make sure that we weren't homeless. Uh, she was going to school full time to get her master's in engineering, had a full time job, all of us kids, my dad's injury and her own life, you know, so there was a lot of, of weight on her shoulders. And I think of a story of one time I accidentally saw her in the middle of the night crying over her homework by herself in the kitchen at like two o'clock in the morning. And um, in that moment, I like slunk back to my bed room because I couldn't imagine my mom seeing me see her being weak mm -hmm. but what I didn't know was that was actually one of the strongest points I had ever seen my mom at because here she is in the middle of the night literally sobbing over her homework and then in a few hours she'd have to have all of us up to go to school and she always would smile my mom has poise like she comes with joy I, I, I I'm, I'm sorry if I cry um but she like she's just sing this song where she try to wake us up in the morning and she'd say get out of that bed and wash your face and hands get mm. into the kitchen and shake them pots and pans or she'd have gospel playing or something going on and she always had incredible energy you know like she's just such a gem um and i'm i've heard a lot of gems about your mom um and miss mamie mrs mamie brown i heard of, through your story but do you have a story like that where it was literally like this is the moment that i understand resilience not because of what i read in a book or heard in a story but because i experienced it with this person oh absolutely mm. It was a deciding point in my life. I was downtown with my mother. And I think I was probably around four or five. Mm. And it was very hot. And so <laughs> I saw a water fountain. And I ran up to the water fountain to start drinking water. And my mother said, Leslie, stop that. And she grabbed me by the the shirt and neck and threw me on the ground. Ooh. And she started hitting me with her fist with a crazy look in her eyes. And I'm saying, Mama, it's me, Mama, it's me, yeah. it's me. And then a white policeman came up 
and he was hitting a knife stick in his hand. He said, okay, you beat that little nigga boy now. He's learned his lesson. And he walked away and he looked at me and he was laughing. And mama hit me in the head and my mouth with the pie. And he said, <laughs> I had to learn you fight. Mm. And my mother said to me, sister, she said, he was coming to watch you with that knife stick. His face was red with anger. Mm. And had he hit you, he would have had to kill me. Mm. I had to do that to distract him. I'm so sorry. And I was still crying. I said, Mom, I said, it's okay. He said, you hit me over here. He kissed me over there right there. He said, you're making well. She said, okay. Oh. I said, I'm over here right here. <laughs> and we both started laughing and crying at the same time. Oh. But she put herself in a position. She had to decide mm. that if this man hits my son, mm. he would have to kill me. And she said, that said to me, she's willing to die for me. Yes. And it taught me the value of courage. The Bible says, be of good courage. And courage is not the absence of fear. Mm. Courage is the willingness to act in spite of fear. Mm. Does mm. that make sense? Oh, perfectly. Yes. Wow. Oh, behave. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow <laughs> I love it wow 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 oh my gosh okay so I have to ask we're gonna shift gears a little bit I love talking about family and speaking you spent some time in politics yes how was that why was that that was fascinating I when I was a state legislator I used to have voter registration drafts and get people out to vote at one time we turned out 95% of the vote every in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, wow. So when I was fired for editorializing about police brutality, yeah. which was unprecedented during that time, and the two white police officers who were fired, they fired me for that. And and then a friend named Horace Perkins, he came to my house and said, hey, I want you to sign this. And I believe God put angels in your life. He mm. brought these petitions. He went around and got signatures for me to run for the Ohio legislature. So I signed it, but I said, but Perkins, I don't know anything about politics. He said, neither do the people who run. <laughs> so true. So I ran and I won, and uh, I passed 14 bills my first term. Oh, that's incredible. Yes, but let me tell you how I got elected. Went to the radio station on Friday before Tuesday. Yeah. And my opponent had over $40,000. I had like $600. <laughs> And so Perkins, who was a salesman at the radio station, he said, come in here, come in the control. This is where you come and your ideas flow because I used to make my own commercials. And something came to me and said, call me. Because I just couldn't come along with parents and say, hi, I'm Les Brown. I want to encourage you to vote for me. I just, I just couldn't bring myself to it. Mm -hmm. So I said, mama, because I always talked about my mother when I was in here. I said, I'm running for the state legislature and I need you to do something for me. She said, you've been running your mouth and you got fired, didn't you? <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. But mama, I need you to say something for me. She mm. said, Leslie, I don't want to be in that mess. I don't know what that is. I said, mama, I'll give you $500. She said, boy, you better send it west of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I said, I don't need you to talk long. Yeah. Just say what's in your heart. Just yes. make it 30 seconds. She said, okay, I don't forget to send me my money today. I'll come for you. Right. So I like I said, her. She said, hello, this is Mrs. Mimi Brown. Uh -huh. When I raised my boys, I raised them to be good boys. Mm -hmm. When they got out of hand, I beat their behinds. Please vote for my son. He's a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I won. Usually you get... 3,000 votes in the state representative race. I got over 26,000 votes. People were coming to the polls that I wasn't even in their district saying, Les Brown's mama say he was a good boy. I right. to vote for them. Many people would not come out of the poll because they couldn't see my name. They had to call the police up. Yeah. 
But it was just that if you have a heart-centered message, mm -hmm. I, I tell speakers, don't let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience needs to hear. Oh, find out about them. Yes, what is it that that they're looking for? Because when you speak to an audience, someone one on one, small group or large group, they're asking three questions: Who are you? Mm -hmm. What do you have? Mm -hmm. And can I trust you? Mm. Okay. Because people don't buy from you, they buy into you. And so, pardon me, so I train speakers how to speak from the heart and expand the vision of the audience to get out of their history to step into their imagination. The imagination is where everything takes place. He mm -hmm. said the scripture, I will give you all your eyes to see. And so when I was in the legislature, I was a fierce debater. Mm. And that's how I got a lot of girls. How did you become such a great orator? Like you are the the way that you connect all of the dots in such a simple, easy, concise way is really mind blowing. To be honest, thank you. How did you become? I studied Malcolm X oh. by any means necessary. Doctor King. Yes. Malcolm X was a communicator. Dr. Yes. King was an orator. Yes. The best speakers make the fewest words go the farthest. Yes, they both. And so I studied them because they mastered their craft. Mm. And Howard Thurman, who was a mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. Billy Graham, I watched and I studied all of them. And I think I'm a combination of all of them. Yes. And you take some material that you believe in, it comes out of your heart, yes. and you own it. You, yeah. you speak from that place of power. Yes. That you help people to discover their power voice and inspire them to do something different with their lives. Wow. Wow. That's so true. Malcolm X is definitely straight a into great the point. Communicator. Yes. yes. And Dr. King, I have a dream. Yes. That's, a, you know, that's another Tell level. a story. Yes. And you so, enroll people into that story. Yes. Yeah, so when you see me speak in the Georgia Dome, Though now I'm speaking as an orator, that speech I gave, it's not over till you win yes. before 80,000 people. Wow. But when you see me speak in a short form, Matt, now that's the Malcolm in me. Yeah. Or in an interview like you talking to me right now. Yes. I'm ready for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, my mama beat the X out of me. Because <laughs> I came home after I heard Malcolm X. And my sister, she ran and met me. She said, Leslie. You got to change your last name back to Brown. I said, my name is Leslie X. Ah! She said, Mama's going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so next day I went to school, I was Leslie Brown. I know, that's right. Yeah, she beat that X out of me. <laughs> How does one accelerate learning? And so for years I would share um, with you know, my service business clients early on when I went from dead broke carpet cleaner to learning how to make that business work, then taking, wow, I figured out a bunch of things that work and now how I share them with other people. And I'm definitely afraid of speaking, so I don't want to go speak, uh, you know, and then I would like force myself to be in situations where I had to present, although I was a nervous wreck. And then I started going to Toastmasters and that was incredibly beneficial. And then it dawned on me like, wow, I'm learning this stuff so much quicker because I'm now putting myself in a position to have to teach other people. So I would then, you know, later share three ways to learn something. You learn through the school of hard knocks. You just don't ask for directions, you know, before GPS, you know, that whole, there, there was that whole stereotype of men never ask for directions sort of thing. Uh, you know, you just bumble your way through life. You figure it out, you'll learn stuff, but you're gonna fail a lot, it's gonna be painful. Uh, so that's one way to learn. Uh, second way to learn is you learn through the experiences of other people. You read their books, go to their seminars, you know, buy their courses, learn, get educated. Uh, not education in school, but education out of school, right? <laughs> the real life education. And that's a, a more effective way to learn. Uh, that's why I read a lot of books, that's why I've gone to a lot of seminars, that's why I've hired a lot of people. So then the third way to learn, which is the most, uh, you know, accelerated, fastest way is you put yourself, you start teaching other people because then you have to integrate it at a whole nother level. So I would challenge that. Well, yeah, I want to hear your perspective on this. Yeah, My, I went to, when I graduated from high school, I had a friend of mine, Larry Littles, he went to Bethune Cookman College, mm -hmm. we graduated together. They traded him to, he, so he, 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 went, he, he went to San Diego Chargers 
he was an offensive God. He was so ineffective there, they traded him for like two or three dollars. He, must he had have been a really coach, ineffective. very ineffective. Yeah. <laughs> but he went to the Miami Dolphins, Don Shula, mm -hmm. a coach. Mm -hmm. Larry became all-star offensive guard 12 years in a row, inducted into the Hall of Fame, Football Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Very seldom that offensive guards are inducted into the Hall of Fame. What was the difference? The coach. coach. Yeah, what the coach was able to find and bring out of him. When I met Mr. Leroy Washington, when I was in his class, when I was put back, when I fell in the eighth grade, and I was looking for a friend, and you know the story, MacArthur Stevens, and Mr. Washington, who's a speech and drama teacher, and I admired his, his oratorical skills and how he trained students and my classmates. And he said, young man, He's going to do a, a play called 12 Angry Men. And so he said, I want you to go out, out up to the front and I want you to work this problem out for me. We're, we're looking for something. And I said, sir, I can't do that. I'm just here looking for MacArthur Stevens. He said, I want you to do what I ask you to do anyhow. I said, sir, I'm not one of your students. I'm just looking for my friend. And the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. And they started laughing. And he asked, what's DT? And they said, he's educable, mentally retarded. He's in special education. And he looked at me, and I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk. He looked at me. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Do you hear me? And I said, yes, sir. He disrupted the story that I believed about myself. And, and as a result of him, he told me three things that serves me today that I mentioned earlier. He said, you want to make it in life, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, number one, develop your mind. You don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. He said, I want you to listen to this. He gave me Earl Nightingale, <laughs> the strangest secret in the world. Wow. He says, number two, practice the principle of OQP, only quality people. The award-winning, Academy Award winner, Sidney Poitier, he wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. He said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens without being spoken. Either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? We earn within two to three thousand dollars of our closest friends. When I found that out, I got all my broke friends out of my life. I said, "Y'all gotta go. Don't go away mad, but y'all gotta go." <laughs> and the other thing he said, Mr. Brown, develop your communication skills, because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. Yeah. And where's James? James, yeah questions of what he said is very important. I did a presentation for a major co a pharmaceutical company and when I was getting ready to leave I saw a sign that said danger zone and and all of these people lined up to go into this room do a presentation and I came in and I was curious to find out what was going on and so there were doctors in the room. I was the only one that was not a doctor except people in the hotel. And so, and this conference was teaching doctors how to communicate with their patients to encourage them to take their hypertension medication. And if they don't, they will have a stroke or they can suffer an aneurysm or heart disease. And so I was seated next to the CEO. And he came in late. I said, excuse me, sir. I said, you're the CEO? He said, yeah. I said, do you have hypertension? He said, yes, and I touched him slightly on his leg. Doctors who touch their patients reduce their chances of having a malpractice suit filed against them by 37%. I said, you have hypertension? He said, yes. I asked him, why do you take your medication? He said, I want to live. Then why do you have a fear-based campaign? Why not have it the success zone appeal to people's desire to want to live. 
He said, you got a point. He said, can you train doctors? I said, yes. <laughs> they had all these doctors there. I'm the only one not a doctor, right? The only raisin in a glass of buttermilk. <laughs> I'm turning red, but y'all can't see it anyhow. <laughs> he said, you got a contract. You'd never believe what that contract was for. Training 3,500 doctors, you'd never guess. Anybody, wild guess. One month. How much money I got paid? No, no, it was small. I just trained them, went to different cities and trained them. But that's good. I like it. I, James, you are a prophet. All right, thank you, though. $640,000. Because I asked the right question. I didn't try and sell myself on it. Everybody, you've heard the expression, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink, right? What we do as coaches and as speakers, we create the want. If you know how to effectively communicate and ask the right questions, then they will want to do business with you. Because our goal and objective, when you look at Joe Polish and his whole staff, they're not here to sell you, they're here to serve you. And that's why you show up. The greatest among you will be your servant. So when you ask the right questions, something Zig Ziglar talked about, and you, in your book addresses this. He said, if you give enough people what they want, they'll give you what you want. My Angelo said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so when you care enough to ask people questions, so as I train speakers, I said, never let what you want to say get in the way of what your customer wants to hear. And all that get and get understanding, find out who are they? What's going on with them? What challenges are they facing? What's keeping them up at night? What, what have they done before that did not work as you talk in those strategic questions? And so I sent out a needs assessment. And when I spoke for Merrill Lynch and, and talked about these two guys who got together in 1905, one was a businessman, the other one was a visionary, as a result of my doing research, people seated in the audience thought that was just one name. Mm -hmm. And I got another 22 engagements out of that. And so you're, you're asking key questions, and but becoming knowledgeable and, and finding out things about your client and incorporating those things in your pre presentation. I spoke to, for a guy named Brian Buffini. Anybody ever heard of him? He sell real estate. So when I go in to speak, I said a needs assessment, Brian filled out. So I wanted to find out where he was and what he wanted because he's a man that signs the check, okay? Then I talked to his top performers and I extracted stories out of them. And so when I got up and was giving my speech, every point that I was going to make in my speech, I've create a framework how trained people do this, I would use their story as an example. So I said, you know, I was talking to James and he's been with the company for years and he said that this, this place he loves because it helps him to begin to learn more about the customers, that life is a question and how we live our lives is the answer. And so James said he loves being here because it's a family consciousness. And when I talked to Veronica, Veronica talked about the day that she was thinking about how she was going through a tough time when a family member died. But every Everybody got together and, and it gave her the strength to weather that red sea, to weather that storm. And when I got to the end of my speech, when I was getting a standing ovation, I said, I'm so glad to be able to see you. And I started walking off and I said, oh, by the way, I'm not too busy for referrals. <laughs> that was it. That's his theme. We're never too busy for referrals. I got 56 speaking engagements. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's not, but that, guess, what, guess what, James? He said, wait a minute, Mr. Brown. He said, this is November. He said, whatever number of engagements that you have for the rest of the year, I want them. I'll write the check for them. And at that time, I was charging $35,000 an hour. 
but he paid for every speaking engagement for the rest of the year because I did research on him. I did, I interviewed the top performers. What is it about you that's different than the rest of the people here? I found out his mission statement. I found out how he met his wife. I said, you know, Brian, one of the things I know about you, when you met your wife, Martha, you became very spiritual and said, the Lord is my shepherd. I see what I want. <laughs> so complimenting his wife, I did research on him and his people and the people that came in the room that I interviewed them individually and used their story. They're saying, oh my God, when I would use their story, they start hunching and he's, he's talking about me, you know. <laughs> and all of those things, you put those elements in, it's different than just going out doing an information dump. If information could change people, everybody would be skinny, rich, and happy. They can Google information. They bring us in. You ask the right questions, you can create an experience. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. And when we look at what this experience that we're going through right now, it's, it's giving us a larger vision of ourselves and allowing us to navigate all the things that we're facing right now. How do you maintain focus in a world that clamors every single day for your attention? How do you remain focused on doing what your, your passion and what you feel is your purpose? And I'm glad you asked that question because in life, what we're doing right now, it is to me, an experiment with life that there's so much noise in this world and most people never achieve their goals because of the noise because it is so distracting uh, one of my students her name is uh, Stacy N.C. Grant and she wrote a book called Action Action despite the distractions and so what most people do they stop and they look around the reason that lot was you know was saying don't look back because you become paralyzed when you allow yourself to be distracted and seduced by the noise of life, that you have to discipline yourself. The road to life is straight and narrow, and few there be that find it, because few there be that are willing to focus their minds. Where focus goes, energy flows. Few mm -hmm. there be that are willing to discipline themselves. And, and as a result, most people allow the dreams, their potential, their goals to be derailed because they take their eyes off of what it is that they're at. Mm, that's really, really powerful. Over the, over the years, what have you seen as the largest barrier for people to find greatness? Their own inner conversation. Their as psychologists would call it, their self-explanatory style. There's an African proverb that I use often. If there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Mm -hmm. And Shakespeare said, the fault dear Buddhists, it's not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. And when we think about where we are and who we are, the, the biggest thing that we have to overcome and I think that Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who wrote the book, The Miseducation of the Negro. Yes. If you can determine what a man shall think, you never have to concern yourself with what he will do. He said, if you can make a man feel inferior, you never have to compel him to seek an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. And if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, you never have to order him to go to the back door. He'll go without being told. And if there's no door, his very nature will demand it. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it was a capital offense if we got caught learning how to read. Just imagine that. Learning how to read. They would hang you if you were a slave. They would shoot you and kill you. Frederick Douglass, in, in his autobiography, talks about the fact that the slave master came home one day and found his wife teaching Frederick Douglass how to read. And he took Frederick Douglass out in the back of the house and he tied him to a guardrail, wooden guardrail, and he beat him with a buggy whip within an inch of his life. 
and cut him, cut it loose, and he fell down unconscious. And he went in the house, and Frederick Douglass was bleeding, and he crawled under the house, and he overheard the slave master yelling at his wife, I told you, never teach a slave to read, because if he learns how to read, he'll never be satisfied being a slave. And Frederick Douglass, under the house, nursing his wounds, decided that he was going to teach himself to read. Frederick mm -hmm. Douglass went on to become one of the greatest abolitionists and great orators of that day. He went on to become an entrepreneur. He, he owned several banks in the South and traveled around the world because he learned how to read and to educate himself. Mm. Now that's hunger. Yes. That is a great example of someone being hungry. You know, you have all of these things stacked up to against you, culture, um, where you were born. It, it's like it's all stacked up against, against you. And life is not a puzzle. To me, it's a mosaic because a puzzle is a finished picture that yes. has been deliberately cut, but meant to be put together. And a mosaic is broken pieces that were never meant to be put together. And we're able to take the broken pieces of our lives and make something absolutely beautiful. And to me, it, 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 it reminds me of something that you talk about in your book, having a sense of urgency. And you gave a great example of Fe Frederick Douglass but, but what does that look like in modern times, Mr. Brown? We don't know how much time we have left. Mm -hmm. We all are going to leave here. We all have an expiration date. Millions of dollars were promoted on a concert by Michael Jackson's group saying, this is it. This was gonna be his last world tour. He had no idea that concert was never going to take place. I was in South Africa and, and Dr. Miles Monroe was across the street from me, the same hotel area. And so I went over to see him because I wrote the forward to his first book, uh, Personal Potential. And so I told the lady, I said, I'm Les Brown. She said, I know who you are. I said, I'd like to see Dr. Miles. She said, Dr. Miles is having uh, a seminar with couples i said if you let him know that i'm here i said i guarantee you he will come out here or he'll call me in there she said i'm gonna do something better she said i'm gonna set up breakfast for you tomorrow morning with dr miles i reluctantly agreed and i know all of us have had moments in ourselves when we say boy if i had just listened to my first mind because i wanted to press her on that i wanted to see him then but i said okay Went down early the next morning. She came down, she said, oh, I'm so sorry. He's already gone. Two weeks later, I get a phone call. Dr. Miles was killed in a plane crash. I was at a table in, in Caesar's Palace. Uh, Gladys Knight and I were married at the time. And I heard Frank Sinatra say to a young man, live each day as if it were your last, because one day, it will be. be. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so we have to live like that. Live each day as if it were your last, because we are here for an appointed time and we have to work while there's still life and do the work that we came here to do. And and so many dreams that have lost out and never came true. There's a quote I love, mm -hmm. many a flower has bloomed unceasingly and waste its sweetness upon the cold desert air. That mm -hmm. many talented and gifted persons have gone mm -hmm. unnoticed and the world never had a chance to be exposed to their genius.